everyone. Um, welcome back. It has been, of course, a minute, but it has been a lot more than a minute since I sat down, even did a bit of research. So yeah, I am so glad to be doing it again. It has taken me a while to get back into the swing of things and um, get settled in, but here we are back and in 2024 Ooh, so first video of the year first of many i hope to try and keep this going and i hope that everybody had a wonderful christmas break and plenty of family time plenty of family memories to be made and i just hope that you all had a wonderful time and who is just looking forward to getting this year started getting going, seeing what we can achieve, oh, hopefully lots of brand new bright things come in 2024 for everyone. And this of course, as you know, is my little mummy time. My time for me, getting to do the research, getting to even make these videos. It might seem quite silly to everybody else, but you know, I do my hair and I put some makeup on. And for a mommy of four who normally is trying to just brush her hair in the morning, I'm sure people can relate. Um, it, it's a little bit of just me time. And I hope that if you enjoy the true crime, this gets to be a little bit of your me time too. Of course, it's for everybody, not just for mummies. But I hope it does help anybody who's out there sit back and relax <clears throat> and enjoy a little bit of true crime, maybe some cases you've heard of, maybe some you've never heard of, who knows. But hopefully here we go. So I had got a new book in the Christmas sales and it was uh, called True Crime Casebook and it was by Sam Pilger and I just love it. I haven't even finished it yet. I, um, I got sort of through the first three or four and it's just brilliant. So it starts off in the 1920s. I highly suggest it. They're like small little case books. So they're quick and easy to read when you have the time to do it. Um, I highly recommend the book. So good so far. So again, in the 1920s, um, this one is from a little bit of its Hollywood theme. So kind of keeping in with the pantos and things like that, sort of, at this time of year. But it's the first case in the book, I think thoroughly enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed researching it. It is unsolved. So a little warning, it's an unsolved murder, but uh, which I normally hate. They drive me insane. They drive me crazy. I can't actually usually read unsolved murders because I'm like, oh, I need the answer. But uh, this one is just, it just got me. Plus you could kind of work it out on your own, but it being America and it's the 1920s and you know all the mob gangs and things were all on the go then as well so but this is so interesting so he's so high profiled um, and he was actually born in a little town in Ireland uh, so let's get stuck right in so yes William Desmond Taylor he was born William Cunningham Dean Tanner and he was born in April 1872 in County Carlo yeah, and he died on the 1st of February 1922 in LA. He was, he moved to LA in 1890. Um, a little bit of a backstory, he was the third son of Major Dean Tanner. Um, his father had sent him off to work in Kansas um, in the 1890s because he failed his army exams and this obviously being the major in the army would have preferred his son to be in the army but um, he didn't so he sent him off to work on the ranch in Kansas and try and start and make a life for himself there. So let's fast forward a little bit we're into the 1900s now um, on the 7th of December 1901 William married Ethel May Harrison and they had a daughter called Ethel Daisy in 1903. A little history about Ethel May D Harrison, his wife. Her father was a very famous, I think like a very high up like stockbroker and stuff. So she, she was also a little bit of an actress herself. 
Um, so yeah, it, it's all sort of coming together. So they had their daughter and then he had a job in an antique store. He, he ran the antique store. Um, I think that Ethel's father actually gave him a lot of help with that to get it up and going. Um, he lived the family life for a very, very short time. So on the 23rd of October in 1908, William left. He left his wife, he left his child, he left his job, he just left. He disappeared, he moved to LA and, um, and actually there was a rumour saying that he phoned the antique shop that morning asking if he could borrow $600 and that he would pay it back once he'd made his way and to the world. But yeah, he just left. Just left his family. Never returned. He never returned. They got divorced in 1912. And eventually he did in 1921 go back and visit his wife and daughter. Um, but I think Ethel got a bit of a shock when the first time she seen her husband again after he had left her was on a big silent movie screen. So yeah, I think that that may have just been a little bit of a surprise. But yes, that was that was William. He decided to follow his dreams and up and left his entire family. Yeah, to go and do that. Now, having said that, he was very good at his job. He was a very good silent actor. He moved into directing and he was very, very renowned. Very good director. He um, directed some of the biggest movies. Yeah, there was about at the time. He directed Huckleberry Finn. And of the Green Gables um, and he also directed Tom Sawyer he worked with big names in the silent movie industry in the 1920s um, he was the head of what is now known as Paramount I think and he was also the director um, like the director of like the like president sorry of like the directors association or something along those lines sorry it took, a, it took a little blank spot for a second there. I'm very sorry. He was known as the gentleman director. Based off his looks and his personality, he was known just as the gentleman director. And, um, yeah, I think it was quite a shock. Everybody loved him. He was handsome. He had money. He lived in a beautiful apartment. He had help. He had a chauffeur. He had... Um, a butler who came and did things for him uh, yeah I think it was all quite a little shock um, when it all finally went down so we'll go into a little bit more detail now the background so on the fateful day on the 1st of February 1922 his butley, butley, <laughs> butler uh, Henry Pevy arrived as usual at 7.30 to go into the house and start his normal day duties he opened the door, realised that something was a little bit off, the living room lights and stuff were still on, or were on, which was unusual because he was going in, he was going to get him up, get him breakfast, take care of his, you know, his um, personal, I suppose he was more like a personal assistant more than anything else um, for the day, and so he knew once he got in and the light was on, something was not great. So he opened the door, and when he walked into the living room then he found William lying on the floor. He was lying on the floor on his back. Um, nothing completely out of the ordinary. He looked as though he had just sort of died of natural causes. Um, again, nothing was robbed. The place wasn't ransacked. There didn't seem to be any forced entry. He was just lying there. A little bit of blood in his mouth, but nothing to suggest anything on toward. Okay, so the butler, or Henry, he calls the police and the coroner. The coroner takes by now to arrive. Nobody can touch the body till the coroner gets there. So the coroner arrived and he turned William over. And when he turned him over, he noticed then there was a bullet hole in his back and um, a pool of blood actually had gathered underneath him. 
So that's when it was like, oh, actually, no, this was not natural. He has been shot in the back. Uh, so, yeah, that's what happened to poor William. So the investigation then, obviously, it takes place. They knock on doors, as the police do, and they went to the neighbours' doors. Neighbours were like, oh, yeah, yesterday evening we kind of heard a bit of a loud noise. Sounded a bit like a gunshot. <laughs> But nobody phoned the police, which baffles me slightly, but it is the 1920s, so I don't, I don't know, I wasn't there. So they said, yes, they had heard it, that it was loud enough, they'd heard the noise, it was loud enough for them to go to their door and see if what had actually been going on. And when they went to the door then, they seen a man standing at William's door. And he was wearing one of those big long trench coats with the collar up a little bit and a cap pulled sort of half down over his face so you couldn't really tell who it was. Um, they said he was very relaxed. He just looked like he was saying goodnight to William and they never thought anything more of it and closed the door and, and they went on their way back into their home. It sort of remind you of like that sort of movies star type bad guy. You know, the big long trench coat and the collar up and the pig cap down. Yeah, this sort of reminds, this sort of reminds me of that. Anyway, after that, about 15 minutes or so after that, I think then the chauffeur, his chauffeur was coming up to drop his keys back, leave the keys into the car and whatnot, knock the door, didn't get an answer. Um, so the police decided that between the time of them seeing that man and the time the chauffeur came, William was already dead. Um, I'm not really sure where the chauffeur went or if he kept the keys. These are things that I'm asking in my head. Obviously, I don't know if other people have asked them, but in my head I'm going, well, what did he do with the keys? Why did he not go into the house? Did he not have a house? Did he post them through a letterbox? Did they have letterboxes? Too many unanswered questions there. But anyway, the chauffeur left. That was that. Um, it was deemed then that William had already been deceased at this point. So that was a very short time. So that's what happened to William. Now we get on to the suspects. So first up was William's former like butler, um, Edward Sands. And reason being that he was a suspect is that he had stolen from William before, like wrote checks, forged checks of up to like $5,000, stole like his personal items, clothing, jewellery, things like that. Um, he was never caught or charged for any of it. Um, but he then, he was fired. Oh, he was sacked now from being William's butler. He was sacked from being in the home. Um, but a month later he returned, robbed the place, took his stuff to the pawn shop, and got a ticket, got the ticket sent to William in William's original name, letting William know that he knew William had a past life and this is what it was. So, you know, that was, I suppose, sneaky in a way, but um, Edward Sands was never seen or heard from after... Um, William's murder, they tried looking for him, never found him. Nobody knows what happened to him. Nobody knows where he went. Nobody knows when he died. Nothing. So, who knows? Could have been Edward Sands. He was not happy with William. Uh, so, we don't know. We just don't know. Because nobody ever seen or heard from him ever again. Which is a bit insane, in my opinion. But, there we go. Next up, we have Mabel Normand, and she was a silent act, oh, silent actress. Excuse me. She was known as the Queen of Comedy, and it is rumored that her and William were actually in a relationship together. Um, although she denies that they were ever intimate or anything like that, it is rumored that he had proposed to her. So who knows? Who knows? Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. 
but um, she was actually one of the last people to see William alive at 7.45 p.m. She left his apartment. She had went to borrow a book and I suppose she was in there for about 45 minutes. She left about 7.45 and she got in her car, said that she kissed her window mirror goodbye when she was leaving him. I'm not sure whether he's at the other side of that or not, but chauffeur drove her off, so she has witness. So he was alive when she left. I don't know. Um, she was ruled out then as a witness, as a, a suspect. Although she did have two guns in her home, which were found. However, they were not a match to the murder weapon. Um, so, no. Her and Mabel. If Mabel and him were in a relationship and this is what happened. Very sad. Very sad indeed. But that moves us on to suspects three and four who are kind of connected well they're not kind of connected they are connected <laughs> there's no kind of anyway so suspect three let's start with her mary miles minter she was also an actress she was 19 years of age she was 30 years younger than william she was completely infatuated with william just could not leave him alone, just wanted him. She was completely infatuated with him. Though he did not have, it was not rim. It was not given back to her. She just loved him. Her mother, who is suspect number four, Charlotte Shelby, did not like this. Did not like this at all. She did not like William. She did not like William around her daughter. She thought he was going to ruin her, ruin her career. No, she was just dead set against. Absolutely not. This is not happening. But poor Mary, she just loved him. She loved him to pieces. And he just didn't return that love. He he was obviously in love with Mabel, apparently. So, uh, yeah. But she, she was. In fact, it was so bad that... Um, at one stage Charlotte, Mary's mother she was actually overheard threatening William that if he ever came near her daughter again she would shoot him there was never anything intimate between the two of them never any evidence of it never anything intimate between the two of them Mary just seemed to be highly infatuated with William now, could that infatuation have turned to hate? We've seen it happen before. Love, love, love. You don't want me? Well, nobody else can have you. It's all happened before. So, who knows? But on that night, on that particular night, uh, Mary and Charlotte had a huge mother-daughter argument. I, I don't know if what these are like. I got teenage daughters. We can have our little spittle from time to time. Nothing major. But, you know, teenagers, mummies. It happens sometimes. However, they had a massive row. To the point where Charlotte locked Mary in her bedroom. Now this comes from Margaret, Mary's sister. Charlotte's other daughter obviously um, and yeah she had locked locked Mary in her bedroom however Margaret was able to testify later on down the line years a few years down the line Mary she got married again and she was going back through her financials of, of years past and had realized her mother had done her out of money or had, had mismanaged financial things and she took her to court and while they were in court they were discussing the case of William because still no, this murder still hadn't been solved nobody knew what was happening nobody knew what had gone on and she was being accused publicly in the papers of oh you done this you murdered him you had this da, da, da. and she was Charlotte was like I didn't I didn't do it I don't know who done it it wasn't me blah 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 blah, blah. anyhow so it was in this night um, the 1st of February 1922 she had locked Mary in her bedroom. However, Mary managed to escape, according to Margaret. She had broke out of her bedroom. Uh, 
I think she broke out about eight o'clock. I think she returned about half eight, quarter to nine, somewhere in that time frame anyway. And it, uh, she said that whenever Mary had returned home, she did appear to be very nervous and visibly upset by the entire, by whatever she had been doing while she was out. Now in William's house, a silk pink nightdress and some love letters to him from Mary were found. And, um, but again, I, she could have planted them there. We're, nobody knows for sure why they were there, but everybody's very adamant there was nothing going on between the two of them. It was all very one-sided. So it's hard to tell, but yeah, it would appear that she managed to escape, come back in, visibly upset and nervous about something. I should also point out at this stage, the police had also managed to figure out that William must have known his killer because he was shot in the back. He was shot in the back by somebody re like reaching round like for a hug and then they're like reaching round. That was funny. Um, so the holes in his t-shirts and jacket didn't match the hole in his back like they didn't line up perfectly which means he was like hugging someone yeah so he was like hugging someone so his arms were up when he was um murdered so they have they ascertained then that he obviously knew his killer i'll also note that the murder weapon was never found however bullets that matched the murder weapon matched bullets that were found in Mary and Charlotte's home. Um, but they were both acquitted. They both, both said in a court of law that no, there was not enough evidence to say that either one of these women knew what was going on or anything like that. So that, that ruled them out as well, apparently. Then we have suspect number five. Really not a suspect at all. It's more of a deathbed confession. Very out there, very random and not a lot of information given. So this was a lady called Margaret Gibson and um, on her deathbed, she confessed to her next door neighbors after taking a heart attack that she was the one who killed William. Um, she was never on the police's radar at any given point she had worked with William on a few occasions she was never in their radar never even her name was never even put in a sheet I don't think um unfortunately that's all she said to her neighbours and then she got taken away and she later died in the hospital and so nobody got any more evidence about it so maybe Margaret Gibson did it maybe she just went a bit cuckoo towards the end I don't no, but um, so that was it. That was William, and that was his murder. And they are his suspects. Oh, I have so many ideas running through my head. My main surmise is that two things either Mary did it herself, went out, maybe tried to get with him, and he said no. So she killed him and then got rid of the murder weapon and then came back to the house. Or two, they hired Sands to murder William. He done it, then disappeared. Never to be found or seen again. But I definitely, definitely think that Mary and Charlotte were definitely linked to that murder some which way. Now... Still unsolved all these years later. The physical evidence, unfortunately, has been destroyed over the time. So it's never really going to get solved, which is so sad. He was so big and so loved in Hollywood. And to just go like that, what a way to go. If you're in the movie business, I suppose, it, it, it creates a story, a drama for later on down the line, many years to come, and some of us can repeat the story. And it's been unsolved, so it's a mystery. But I do hate unsolved cases. 
but that is my theories anyway my two theories um but yeah uh that was a quick one i hope that you thoroughly enjoyed it i am getting back into swing of things a little bit it's gonna take me a little while but i'm getting there and um yeah that, that's it for our video of 20 first video of 2024 and hopefully there'll be many many more to come thank you so much for staying with me all this time if you made it through and i hope to see you all again really soon so have a lovely january and um i'm thinking probably february before we get another video out there but maybe you never know and i hope to see you all really soon have a lovely weekend and the rest of your holidays i will see you soon bye